other words, losing has to mean something. It can't just feel something. Losing has to mean something. Love can't just feel something. Love has to mean something. And even if we don't think so deeply about figuring out what it means, it still means something. Everything means something, whether we recognize it or not. Everything has a deeper meaning than just the superficial thing that we encounter. How deep you want to go into it is entirely up to you. How deeply you want to understand the thing is entirely up to you. I guess that becomes a question. How deeply do you want to understand love? How deeply do you want to understand politics or sports or losing or chess or academics? Because the things that you really want to understand probably are the things that you love. And that's how it is that you love a person. That's how it is that you are loved. To love a person, you have to know them at a deep level. And to, and to be loved, people have to know you at an intimate and deep level. And this is why some people struggle to be loved because they won't let people know them at a deep level. They have these walls up and they fold their arms and scratch their chins and I'm not gonna let anybody in. Okay, do you know why? Because I've been hurt in the past. Yeah, but do you know why? Not to sound like a five-year-old, but why, 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 why? And what you're probably going to find is that it's probably deeply difficult for you to love yourself. I don't know about you guys, but I think about it sometimes that my parents sacrificed way too much for me to be mediocre, for me to accomplish nothing. At some point, you've got to make their sacrifices worthwhile. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what are some things that Nietzsche would say should be to, to belong to the realm of feeling and passion? Uh, yeah, so things like what's that? Oh yeah, like politics and chess, <laughs> academics. Banking, oh. sports. What are some things that should be relegated to the, to the realm of thinking? Love and losing, I suppose. In other words, when we separate these things out, we separate ourselves. If I were to ask you, are you a thinking being or are you a feeling being? The answer to that question, of course, is yes. Yes, you're both of these things. And then we ask the question, which one should you be? Yes. Yes. You should be both. Why? Well, you know you should be both because you are both. If there was no benefit to it, then you wouldn't be that thing. You wouldn't be both. I mean, if being just purely rational was the thing that benefited our species, then that's all you would be. If being purely emotional was the thing that benefited our species, then that's what you would be. But the fact is that we are all both of these. It's not like some people are, are one and some people are the other. Unless you're... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then similarly, anybody, as, as unintellectual as they are, there's still some level of thinking there. So nobody is ever any just one thing. And even if, and it's, some of us may be more of one than the other, but I hope we can see that the more you are of both of these things, the more complete of a human being that you are. And there's almost, almost, maybe, nothing that's more important to be than to be a full human being. When you come across a person who's just completely emotionless, you, hey, what do you talk about? Because you can't really talk about anything. Try talking politics with somebody who has no emotion. What will they say? I don't care. If you have no emotional investment in politics, here's what you'll think about politics. I don't care. Yep. If you have no emotional investment in, in chess, guess what you're going to say? Well, but not that much, so. So you, so you would care a little bit, but some of us in here would not care even a little bit. If you have no feelings about, about the things that you're studying, if you have no opinions about them, no strong feelings about the things that you're studying, or about banking, or about sports, you just aren't going to care. Some of you care absolutely zero about sports. This is true, and some of you care tremendously about sports. 
I mean, the whole, the whole notion of being a sports fan, what, what, is, what, is, what is the word fan short for? Fanatic. Yeah, to be fanatical about, about, about a team. I'm a sports fan. I'm fanatical about my sport. That, su that doesn't suggest that you're very intellectual about it. I mean, there. That, doesn't mean, that doesn't suggest that you're just unfeeling about it, that you're purely thinking about it. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if there's any Padre fans in here, man, but like, if I were to ask you at the beginning of the season, how do you think things are going to go? A lot of times Padre fans would just say to me, Dodgers suck. <laughs> it's not what I asked you. I asked you, how do you think the Padres are going to do? I think the Padres are going to be the Dodgers. Oh, okay. But how do you think you're going to do in the, in the whole season? <laughs> beat LA, beat LA. That's, that's not a lot of thinking going on there. It's a lot of feeling, though. Now, if you had to stop and think about it, why is it that the person is, is wrapped up holding the feeling? Because they're aware that if they have to stop and think about it, they're going to say, oh, we'll, finish, we'll probably finish like third or fourth this year. But wait till next year. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing about, about sports. There's always next year. There's always next year. Especially the, <laughs> Especially as a Dodger fan, keep waiting for next year. Keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting. But you can't talk to people about almost anything over here on this side unless there's some of that going on, unless there's some level of feeling going on because you, don't, you simply don't, don't care about it. And the, the, the very word itself, care, suggests a sense of feeling about something. And so if you're thinking about things like, like justice, that might be important to you, or even just things like adventure, that might be important to you. They're important to you because they're important to you on an emotional level. And once you have that emotional connect, uh, commitment to it or that emotional connection to it, then your intellect almost like shapes it. Why is it that a person would, would do philosophy? It's going to be insane to do it. There's only one reason to do it. Because you love it. And you have to do it. Yeah, but it's not going to get you any money. It's going to make you, it's going to, it's going to change your, like I've, all the things I've told you. It's going to change your view of the world. It won't make any money. It may even make you insane. Yeah, but I love it, so I have to do it. Why on earth would a person study banking? There has to be a level of love in it for them. Even numbers, especially numbers. There's nothing drier than numbers. You can't do that unless you have a, some, some level of a passion for it. You know, sports, you can't do it unless you're passionate about it. And anything that you're, that, you're, that you're feeling too. The whole idea of losing has to be affecting you at, a, at, a, at a, an emotional level, but it only happens in the, in the mind first. In other words, losing has to mean something. It can't just feel something. Losing has to mean something. Love can't just feel something. Love has to mean something. And even if we don't think so deeply about figuring out what it means, it still means something. Everything means something, whether we recognize it or not. Everything has a deeper meaning than just the superficial thing that we encounter. How deep you want to go into it is entirely up to you. How deeply you want to understand the thing is entirely up to you. I guess that becomes a question. How deeply do you want to understand love? How deeply do you want to understand politics or sports or losing or chess or academics? Because the things that you really want to understand probably are the things that you love. And that's how it is that you love a person. And that's how it is that you are loved. To love a person, you have to know them at a deep level. You have to know them at an intimate level. And to, and to be loved, people have to know you at an intimate and deep level. And this is why some people struggle to be loved. Because they won't let people know them at a deep level. They have these walls up. And they fold their arms and scratch their chins. And I'm not going to let anybody in. Okay. Do you know why? Because I've been hurt in the past. Yeah, but do you know why? Not to sound like a five-year-old, but why, 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 why? And what you're probably going to find is that it's probably deeply difficult for you to love yourself. And we've talked about that. Loving yourself is not just, it's not just a meme. It's not just an Instagram post. You've got to love yourself. No, you've got to find a reason to love yourself. Just like Frankel talks about being optimistic, you can't just will yourself to be optimistic. You have to have a reason to be optimistic. You can't just laugh. You have, to, you have to have a reason to laugh. You can't just love yourself. You have to have a reason to love yourself. And so it goes back to this question I've asked you many times. What is so lovable about you? Me. You're lovable about you? <clears throat> Don't make us vote. But to know what those things are. 
Because there is something, there are things, but to unpack them. And now if that's the thing, if, if those are the, the things that you find that make, that make it so that you are lovable, well then how on earth can another person love you unless you show them those things as well, unless they get to see them as well. And the more that you kind of shield yourself and protect yourself, because you're not really protecting yourself, by the way. You're just, you're just putting up these walls. But the more that you that you allow people to see those things, of course, the more people can love you. Are people going to hate you for those things? Maybe. Maybe in the same way that a witch looks into a mirror and hates herself, hates, the, and hates beautiful people because they have that, because they look the way they look, perhaps, from the old fairy tales. But that says more about them than it does about you. Are people going to come after you? They're going to come after you anyway. But tell me if you've heard this before. Life is suffering. And you don't get to choose not to suffer. But you can choose what you're going to suffer for. People are going to come after you either way. What do you have them come after you for? The things that really are you? Or the things that are not really you? Yeah. We're eating meat. We're, we're only <clears throat> feeling like the food. But we're not actually thinking about the animals. So that, but that's why we don't care. Yeah. You really think about that, man. Everything that you're eating lived. <laughs> it's one of those sad things I go to Walmart. I really mean that. It really is sad sometimes. I go to Walmart. That's it. Let's go to Walmart. That's sad. No. I go to Walmart and you stand in front of those rotisserie chickens. They're in the boxes, you know, right? underneath the heat lamps. Yeah. And it's like a chicken for like $6.99. You ever think about that? That chicken's life. It was born, it was brought in the world, it was fed to semi-adulthood, it was butchered, it was plucked and everything, it was parsed out, took the head off of it, it was seasoned, it was put into an oven, ba uh, baked, put in that container, wrapped up in another container, put into a big box of containers and then shipped to Walmart, and yet they can still make a profit on it at $6.99. How much is that chicken's life worth? Yeah. In other, words, how, in other words, how much money did they invest in the life of that chicken so they can still make a profit at six ninety nine? Six bucks, five bucks, four bucks? I don't know, man. I don't know. But yeah, you ever think about that? Like what the what the life of that chicken was worth? Last period, someone showed me a picture of a cow, and then she goes, "Trigger warning." I'm like, really, dude? I need a trigger warning. <laughs> and then she shows me the, that they that they're uh, butchering the cow. I'm like, oh, neat, tasty. <laughs> Why? Because you should see that once in a while. Why? Because it maybe can give you an appreciation for it. Because everything that you eat lived, everything that, 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 that has life has taken life. It's that cycle. Oh, but I don't like thinking about that because I feel bad. Put them together. You can, you can shift how you feel about it. You can feel a level of appreciation for it. This thing died so I can live. I appreciate that. You realize that to a certain extent, your parents died so that you could live. They had to give up aspects of their old life so they could bring you into the world and be there for you as a, as a parent. I didn't ask them to. Yeah, whatever. But they did. And you can correct that at any moment you choose not to. So the fact that you continue to live. And that's because they've sacrificed something. I don't know about you guys, but I think about it sometimes that my parents sacrificed way too much for me to be mediocre, for me to, to accomplish nothing. At some point, you've got to make their sacrifices worthwhile. Or be able to look them in the eye and tell them, sorry, mom and dad, for all your sacrifices, but not sorry. I'm going to be mediocre. You know, and give them the opportunity to mourn their sacrifices. Or look them in the eye and say, I hope it was all worth it. Because we all get to decide for the things that we're going to suffer for. But if we get to decide, and that's, that's freedom. And hope that we all get to decide for that at some point. But the second that you can get rid of this dichotomy and you can mix these things up, the more complete of a human being you're going to be. Because that's what you are. You're a thinking thing. You're a feeling thing. You're a rational thing. You're an emotional thing. So the, the, the point is to put these things in their proper natural order. What's the point of your feelings? To tell you the things that you want. It's built into the language that we use. I want this thing. The idea of want suggests a feeling. Desire, love, all of these things suggests feelings. 
the proper role of the intellect or the mind is to help you figure out how to get those things. Well, I guess first off to decide if they're good for you, and then secondly to figure out how to get those things. Because largely we realize that things are good for us, we know what they are. If things are bad for us, we typically know what are bad for us. Sometimes we need to think more about it, and that gives us that gray area. But your feelings and your passions tell you the things that you want. Your intellect, if you use it properly, and you develop it properly, will help you get those things. So the more that you can erase that dichotomy, the more complete and undivided of a human being you're going to be. Not constantly at war with yourself, but instead always in synergy with yourself, pursuing the things that you want and think. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? 